All right, so we are going to talk about machine learning. Uh, hmm. So in machine learning, it is a vast field as all of you might know, but here today we are going to talk specifically about one subfield of it called supervised learning, right? And in supervised learning, what we mean is that we have a data set of the data set of the form x and y, many, many pairs of x i and y i, such that we such that there is some unknown function f that y i equals function f of x i and we would like to discover or learn this particular function f right so ultimately it is the problem is about uh, fitting some kind of function to the data set that we have we might have a large data set of let's say n number of data points now in supervised learning there are a couple of important assumptions and one of the big assumption is called the iid assumption which means that our data set is independent and identically distributed what do these two terms mean and why are they important? Uh, what independence means, independent means is that each pair is not, um, each pair is not related to the other pair of data points. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have a data set of images of um, cats and dogs and fishes, right? So, and the data set is all jumbled up. So it's not like if you have seen one image before, then that image will somehow give you useful information about the next image, because each image is independent of the previous, uh, previous image. So now there might be some underlying connections between them, right? So if you're trying to train some kind of model to classify whether it is a dog or cat or fish using all this data, it might learn the connection between dogs and cats that they are sort of this land animals which have four legs and one face and something like that. Whereas fish are usually look quite different. So there are underlying connections between these two. But what I mean by independent is that uh, let's say you train some model, you showed it one image of a fish, right? Then uh, correctly or incorrectly predicting that that is a fish will not affect its, uh, should not, af will not affect its, uh, should not affect the thing that it has to predict for the next image because the next image can be of anything. It can be of a dog, or cat or even another fish. Um, but it's free to explore the underlying connections between these images. And by identically distributed, I mean that the distribution of, um, like the distribution of percentages of data does not change as you move through the data set. So one example is, let's say you, um, you collected a data, you collected a data set by recording a video of moving through a zoo, right? So you are taking, you have a camera in your hand and you started recording and you move through the entire zoo. So in that case, image number 552 is not independent of image number 551 because 
because you are moving so you cannot move beyond a certain distance from one image to another image so 552 has to be mostly seeing what 551 also saw because the camera just moved a little bit and let's say this zoo has an indoor area and outdoor area and things like that so the distribution of colors and the distribution of lighting uh, is going to change uh, as you move from time zero to the end of the video right if you consider the video as a data set um, and that distribution uh, changes from outdoor to indoor and from indoor to outdoor things like that so that's an example of non-iid data set but in this case for the kind of supervised learning that we are talking about right now uh, it is an iid data set so it's just kind of like a large data set of images or a large data set of sentences and things like that which can all be which are which don't have any kind of temporal sequence or uh, those kinds of dependence between various in individual data points so you can randomly uh, change the order of all the data points and the data set will still remain valid now uh, you know there are there are many deep theoretical uh, reasons why this iid assumption is important but we will not go into details there details today um, I think we will explore some of those things in the next lecture when we talk about reinforcement learning and robotics. But for now, uh, I just wanted to make you aware of this term and roughly what it means, and you can read more about it on Wikipedia or things like that. So, um, also you should be aware that this IID assumption is actually not very realistic because in many real world cases, uh, this assumption is violated. Like, as I said, for example, in robotics or when you're taking videos and you want to do machine learning on videos and things like that. Um, but, but still it is a, it is like a nice, nice assumption that allows us to learn some basic properties of machine learning. And that's why we are uh, operating under that assumption today. Now, some uh, some other basic concepts in machine learning is as i said we are going to be given a data set and we will try to find this function f that relates inputs to the outputs but um one very good uh, one very good advice when trying to implement any machine learning project is basically this training validation and testing split what this means is that whatever algorithm you do to learn this function f you should not apply it on your entire data set right because otherwise you will not uh, you will not have a good idea about how your model will perform on some data that it hasn't trained on before so let me give you an example here, um, a very simple example. Let's say we have a two-dimensional world, right? And um, yeah, and then somebody gives us this data set where each data point is a point in this two-dimensional world. So each data point has two features. Let's, let's say x1 and x2. So there are all these uh all these data points like this right and we want to fit a model such that uh, when someone gives you uh, as input uh, some x1 value you want to predict as output the corresponding x2 value you know it could be something like uh someone the input is the number of the input is 
the length of the petal of a flower and the output is the width of the petal of the flower or any kind of other data. So let's say that this is the data that someone gives us to train, like we can do all of our training on this. And then we notice that um, if we if we assume that this data this data is lying is on a line, then we will kind of try to if we do it properly, then we will arrive at kind of a line that goes through roughly through all of these points, right? Now, you might observe that if you have a line, then different points are not exactly on the line. So this is kind of a line that compromises between all those points. Um, but when doing many, many experiments, maybe if someone is very intelligent, then they figure out, oh, if what if I say that these are not a line, but it's actually some uh, some polynomial of much higher degree, right? Because line is a polynomial of degree one, but maybe they say that, okay, let me make my polynomial degree 10. Then I can actually like fit a polynomial just like this, you know, and maybe this degree 10 polynomial happens like that based on all this data. Then, uh, you might see that this polynomial, even though it fits this data quite well, much better than the line, the amount of data that we were given, given for training. But then when you actually get some new data uh, that was not seen during training, so this is when you have uh, made your model you're kind of ready to your model and you've given it to your client and the client uses the model on their own data. What if they have some other data that's like, that's here, 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 then according to your own testing, your model was giving really small errors, right? So you are very confident that, oh, my model is really good. It will perform really well. But then the client tests it and finds out that, oh, there are like huge errors in the data, uh, in the application of this model. So that is why always um, we have to do this kind of uh, train validation testing split. Because if we do that, then uh, what happens is Usually this testing part is not even given to us by the client or whoever is asking us to train the machine learning. So we don't even see this anytime. We only have access to this train and validation. And by ourselves, we are going to split this particular part into, let's say 80% um, training and 20% validation data, where we will do all our training on just 80% of the data. And we will keep this 20% data uh, separate so that we can make various training decisions. Like, should I try to fit a line to this data or a parabola or, you know, a cubic spline or quadratic uh, quadric spline, whatever. We can uh, try, try out all those different uh, decisions which are usually called hyperparameters and then test them out on this 20% data so that we have kind of a good a better idea of how it will perform when it actually gets the testing data so i think there was a simple concept that i thought i should mention i'm sure a lot of you already know about that concept so that's about train validation and testing split. Now, let's get into some of the uh, some of the mathematical details, right? So, okay. So now we will talk about. A very simple problem. We'll say it's basically regression. That means in this y equals fx kind of relationship, 
this y is a real number it's not a, a binary number it's just true or false or cat or dog or something like that so let's say that um, we want to talk about the concept of a loss function A loss function basically measures how good your prediction is against the ground truth that you have. So in this data set, I will just call it D, which has many, many pairs of um, Xi and Yi, where I goes from, let's say one to N. The input input is Xi and Yi are the labels or some people also call them ground truth right so these are the kind of outputs that we are trying to achieve from this input and let's say that uh, we uh, we want to measure how good our output is. So usually that is done by this loss function, which we will call, let's say L, right? So this loss function for real numbers, it could be something very simple, like it could be um, our prediction Y minus the ground truth Y star. and maybe the square of that to, uh, I will tell you the reason for why we need the square a little bit later. Now this y is actually uh, coming from whatever function that we are going to uh, fit to our data. So this is actually fx minus y star square, okay. So then the idea is this function f has some parameters. So let's say um, these parameters are called theta. We'll call them theta. So we will write that as y equals some function of x and then semicolon theta. So this means this function converts the input x to the output y using the parameters theta. Um, so then, uh, then we have a loss function, which is actually a function of theta, because then we actually have something like this right because depending on different values of theta our function f will change and that function that change in the function f will give us uh, better or worse predictions which will be closer or farther away from our ground truth y star right so then this function l actually measures how good these parameters theta are because these parameters theta are controlling this function. Um, so we want some way to measure uh, how good a particular value of parameters theta is. So let's say in this case, um, we are assuming that the form of our function f is a line, right? So in that case, what will f, um, so in that case, let's say we are trying to predict x2 from x1. So we will write x2 equals f of x1 given theta. Now, if it's a line, then we know the equation that it will be x2 equals m times x1 plus c, where m is the slope and c is the intercept. So in this case, the parameters theta become our m and c. So, uh, this kind of in this indicates 
two terminologies where the function f kind of indicates the class of class of model that we are trying to fit and here the class of model is a line so we are saying that we will try many many different models but all of them will be lines and a line to specify a line you need some parameters theta and they are the slope and intercept of that line similarly you can imagine much more complicated models and many many more parameters right so that is what this uh, loss function l indicates it indicates that for a particular value of slope and intercept uh, like let's say we try this particular line so it has a particular slope and intercept and we have some quantification of how good this line fits to all this data right we can measure the perpendicular distance of all the points from the line you know and uh, and add all of that so that will give us some measure of how good it is then we can have another line with another value of parameters and this one will have smaller perpendicular distances so then we will say that okay this line l2 is maybe better than line l1 so what that means is usually we want to minimize this loss function right so we want to find a value of theta that minimizes our loss function and that is why we need this square here because what if we did not have the square right if we did not have the square then uh, like f fx minus y star can can be a negative number like let's say uh, yeah let's say that um so in that case uh like in that case if we did not have the square then basically any line like maybe like this neg this line here you know l3 where all the x2 values are negative that will actually be uh, considered better if we are trying to minimize this right but if we have a square then we are actually trying to uh, just measure the magnitude magnitude of the distance from the various points to the lines and then we can have uh, if we have an, a big data set then we can add it all so actually it will be some i equals 1 to n f of xi with a particular parameter theta and for the particular xi of our data set we have the yi ground truth right so we can add this loss value for each and every point in our training split of the data set and if we want we can also divide this by n so it becomes average rather than just addition so there is some kind of basic understanding of loss functions then okay there's one important concept here which is about convexity so let us continue this example uh, that we are trying to uh, we are trying to fit a line right okay yeah we are trying to fit a line to our data um and so this f of x i theta equals m times x i plus c so then what will we have we will have m x i plus c minus y i star square right
now if we expand this square then it will become m square xi square plus 2 m xi this plus c square y i square um minus two this so we just expanded the square there so let us see what are the unknowns here and what are the knowns we are trying to find a good value of theta that means we are trying to find a good value of m and c so the uh so the known quantity, the, all these xi's and yi's are actually known quantities in here because they are our data set. The unknown quantities are these m, you know, m square, c square, m times c, 2c, those kinds of things. So ultimately we see that this is a second order polynomial in M and C, right? And so, uh, what that means is, we all know like what is the general form of second order polynomials, right? We have uh, all these parabolas and hyperbolas and things like that. If it's a first order polynomial, then it's a line. Um, so the in general, I think um, if you if I remember correctly, the hyperbola is a special case where there are some uh, negative uh, some negative properties and things like that. But in general, this is actually going to be a uh, if we if you look at the the square here and things like that, uh, this is in general going to be a parabola. Uh, so uh, if you just kind of uh, draw a parabola in general, what that looks like is kind of like kind of like this, right? So we have. On this axis, we have our parameter theta. So actually here our parameter theta consists of both the M and C, but for this kind of uh, illustrative example, I will just say that my theta consists of just one number. And the same explanation will be correct even when this theta is multidimensional. It's just that it's easy to draw uh, when theta is single dimensional. So here we have theta and then on the y-axis, we have our L theta. And since L theta is a second order polynomial of theta, then it will look like something like this, where this is basically called a convex function. What that means is that, um, If you like, if you take some, if you take two values, let's say this is um, theta two, theta one, right, and correspondingly. You have L, L theta one here and L theta two here. Um, the condition for checking whether some function is convex or not is that uh, is the following. 
So the condition is that this function is L over here. So if we have some kind of some value alpha plus one minus alpha theta two, then that should be less than or equal to alpha times L theta one plus one minus alpha times L theta two. where alpha is between 0 and 1. What this means is that uh, we are basically combining here, we are combining theta 1 and theta 2 with some percentage, right? So basically as we go from when, when alpha is 0, then we are at theta 2. And when alpha is 1, we are at theta one. So as we go from theta two to theta one, uh, the the value of L will go, you know, from here to here, something like this. So at every point we can follow the curve that I have highlighted here. But so that is on the left hand side. On the right hand side. We are not combining theta one and theta two, but we are combining these L values here. So as we go from theta two to theta one, we are actually going along this line, right? So let's say, let's say alpha equals to 0 0.5. So at 0 0.5, you know, the, this alpha theta one plus one minus alpha theta two will be at the midpoint. So at the midpoint, our uh, left hand side is this, right? Similarly, the right hand side, uh, we also take the midpoint, but now the midpoint is of L theta one and L theta two. So the midpoint of L theta one and L theta two is on, is on this line here. So this RHS is higher than the LHS. And actually, you can take any two points on this curve and see that that is true. So that is why this is a convex function. And if you actually apply um, apply this kind of analysis to this equation that we wrote here, um, you will find that it satisfies this condition. So this kind of loss function is a convex function. And how did we start? So the uh, the starting point of this loss function was this. So basically, uh, or, or actually, if we consider the whole data set, then it's this, where we just take the sum of the square differences. So this is also called mean squared error or MSC. It is a very uh, famous loss function. Now, why I went into all this uh, trouble with all the convex functions is the following. Because convex functions have a very beautiful property that first of all, uh, we saw that we want to minimize this loss function, right? So if, a fun if the loss function is convex, then that means it will only have one minimum point. It's not like the function because there could be some other function where you have theta here, L theta here. It could be any any kind of function, right? Well, uh, it could be sort of like this, where it has um, like it has some local minima. Which, if you are just looking at this part of the data, then it might seem like this is the minimum point. But actually, if you see more data, then you will find that this is the minimum point, right? But for a convex function, this goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. So it only has a single point. And no matter where you start, uh, so remember each starting point, uh, each starting point is a value of theta. So it's like some parameter. Um, if it could be, 
the slope and intercept of a line or some other thing. But no matter where you start, if you look at the slope of the curve and if you just kind of go down the slope, keep going down the slope and you just make sure that you don't go up. If you stop, if you stop exactly when you start going up, then you are guaranteed to reach the minimum point of it. And that is very useful when you're trying to minimize the uh, loss function. Uh, but let's let's look at just very quickly um, how you would do that, right? So let's say initially you are at some value, uh, some value theta, right? So now what you will do is um you know so you, you you are at this value of theta so you know how on you can take if you know the equation of some kind of curve then you can take its gradient right and that gradient will uh, actually point you towards the, uh, the the gradient will indicate you towards the tangent of that curve so you take the gradient, it will point you in this direction. So that means now your theta one, which is your new value of theta. So let's say you start at theta zero. So this is theta zero. And and then if you do minus some some number mu times the gradient of this function with respect to theta at the gradient at theta equals theta zero, right? Because at each point the gradient is different. But if you start at theta zero and then you take one step, which is indicated by uh, which is indicated by this term, then you get theta one. So then you will arrive here, let's say, theta one. Then you will do theta two, and eventually you will come here, and you will stop as soon as you start going up. But that same strategy does not apply here, right? Because let's say you are, um, let's say you are here, you take one step, you come here, you take another step, you come here, then you try to, uh, follow the gradient, but the gradient is pointing you in this direction, right? And so you're going up. Um, and so, you, but you, the algorithm is to stop when you go up. So then you will be you'll be stuck here, and you will think that you reach the minimum point. Um, so that is the difficulty associated with this non-convex loss function that it is not very easy to minimize and one of the most um, most famous ways to minimize it is you have what is called random restarts so you perform many many uh, this is called gradient descent right because you're going you're following along the gradient and trying to go down the loss function so you start here, then you randomly start at some location here, you randomly start at some location here, and you start at some location here, and you do gradient descent from all those locations. And then after that, the hope is that at least one of these uh, random restarts will bring you to a point where the gradient descent will take you to the actual minimum of this, um, of this loss function. But you can imagine that just for this single dimensional theta, you have to do so many random restarts. So if you have many, many dimensional theta, then you, you need to do um, almost impossibly large number of random restarts. Now, um, let's see. So that was about this um, regression and convexity and things like that. Um, then I want to um, change a little bit and go from this regression 
to classification where again it is something like this but um, our value y let's say it belongs to a particular a particular set so if it's just two possible values then maybe we say minus one plus one or it could be a particular set of classes like right? maybe it's like uh, cat dog fish it it just has to choose between one of these three things okay so how do we do that mm, one of the most uh, one of the most famous algorithms for doing classification is called support vector machine or SVM. And I will kind of show you using some drawings and some intuition how we can uh, think about an SVM. So let's see so again we are going to assume a two-dimensional data set where is x1 and x2 each data point is so in our data set you know xi yi this yi is binary so minus one plus one and this xi is two-dimensional right so xi is actually um like x1 x2 so each data point will be a point here and so someone gives us this data let's say sort of like Sort of like this where these are the two different classes right and so we might think the most natural way to try and do classification here is to is to come up with some kind of line that divides these two regions of uh, this divides these two regions of this plane so um what is like you could equation of a line in this plane will be something like ax1 plus bx2 plus d equals zero right or if we write it in if we write that um this vector x equals x1 x2 and vector w equals a b then we can write w transpose x plus d equals zero right so we can let's say we can have this line or this line or like there could be many many lines you know like maybe this line all of them are uh like all of them are dividing it up dividing up so let's say this is the kind of this is the kind of line that we came up with so our fx given theta will be w transpose x plus d right where our theta now becomes um, a b and d or like basically theta is our collection of w and d both of these constitute our parameters so now what we do if you want to classify let's say someone gives us a new point uh, somewhere on this plane x so we put that and we 
we, we calculate the value of w transpose x plus d and then if w this line actually is w transpose x plus d equals zero right because we had this equals zero here and then we see that if it is uh, less than zero then maybe then we will call it this class and if it is greater than zero then we will call it the z class so that is how we will do our classification now the question becomes um, even even in between these two red and green regions there are many possible lines so how should we actually choose a line now you can imagine that let's say um, we are still operating in that kind of training testing split or uh, that i talked about before so this is all the training data that we have so using the training data let's say we actually said that our line is something like this so this line is also correct it correctly classifies both the red and green but it is more risky right because uh, we know that the training data is not the entire data set so let what if just some some new point comes um, which is just on this side of the line right so it will actually misclassify that point so from from this example uh, we kind of have this motivation of what is called a max margin where we say that we want a line which is uh, whose margin is maximum and what is the margin margin is basically the distance of that line from uh, the distance of that line from the nearest points on each side right so we want kind of a line which is uh, exactly like in the middle of these two regions so that there is uh, there is some room for error like let's say this line is sort of in the middle so if next time someone gives us some new data point which is here 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 yeah or or even like here then this line will be less risky so how do we mathematically express that idea the way to do that is instead of a single line we will actually uh, come up with two lines so it's kind of like this um so the middle one is the same as before w transpose x plus d equals to zero but um this one all of them are parallel so they have the same uh they have the same slope right so actually in this form of the line the slope is actually what um minus a by b right so it is um, the slope is contained within this vector w because the w is the collection of both a and b so if the w is the same then the slope slope is the same so this one equals minus one and this one is w transpose x plus d equals plus one now um, what is the what is the distance between these two lines so let's uh, try to write those lines like this so the one line is ax plus by plus um, plus d minus one equals to zero and the other one is ax plus by plus d plus one equals to zero so this is the constant in both of these lines and we know that you know the distance between 
two parallel lines is basically the magnitude of d minus one minus d. Uh, sorry. Minus one divided by square root of b square plus b square. So it is actually two divided by square root of a square plus b square. Or if we write w instead of a and b, then it will be two divided by the norm of our vector w. So, and now again we have our data set like this. Yeah. So now um, the the idea for this SVM is that um, is that we will actually try to find we will actually try to find uh, we will actually try to uh, try to find this kind of central line and then we will push the margin we'll try to maximize the margin so maximizing the margin means we'll try to push both of these lines out out like that as much as we can and we saw that this margin is this. So if we want to maximize this margin, then we want to minimize this denominator, right? So let's say we want, we are writing our loss function here, which we want to minimize. We want to minimize this, then if one of the things is our margin, then it will be, uh, since we want to maximize the margin, we will try to minimize the norm of this w vector here because we saw how that is equal to the distance between these two lines or inverse reciprocal of the distance. So when we are minimizing this, we are actually pushing these two lines farther away, but we don't want to push them too far out so that they start misclassifying. So we want to do this uh, such that all these points, let's say, um, so here, let's say this is, uh, when we have this is like, this is minus one, and this is indicated by plus one. So basically I'm talking about the value of the ground truth y for this red and green. So such that, what if I write like this, yi times w transpose x plus d greater than equals to one. So let's see how this works. So for all the green points, the y is minus one and w transpose x plus d is equals to minus one. So this minus one multiplied by minus one becomes positive. And if the point is more and more farther away, then it will become more and more, uh, this W transpose X plus D will become more and more negative, right? So this will become, since it is multiplied by minus one, it will become bigger and bigger than one. So that satisfies this inequality. And similarly on this red side, because this label is plus one and here w transpose x plus d is also plus one. So like, so this is another loss function that if we kind of solve this loss function, then it will, uh, it will give us, it will give us this kind of line such that ultimately, these two lines will be pushed exactly till they hit one particular point on this uh, two different sides, right? And 
then like out of the whole data set the points like this one and this one that are exactly on the margin are called the support vectors support vectors um, because they're kind of like supporting this whole construction uh, so that is the idea behind this loss function now you might you might be wondering how this this such that thing can be solved right because it's not it's not exactly it's not like we can do this kind of uh, gradient descent on this such that so actually if the loss function were just like this um, then that means basically w transpose w right now w transpose w is actually a convex function of of uh, l of w so if it were just like that then we could directly use this gradient descent algorithm to solve that but we have this such that part here so one trick that people use is they write it like this um, so in the norm of w plus right so they and then you can minimize this so what does this mean if my uh, this term is already greater than one so y i multiplied by w transpose x plus d is already greater than one we saw what that means that means that point is safe it's very far away from the decision boundary so we don't care about that so if it is already greater than one then this term will be negative but this max with zero will make the entire term equal to zero right so those points will not matter in this loss function but if my yi times w transpose x plus d is less than one that means my point is somewhere in this region here uh, less than one then uh, then this term will be positive right and so uh, this max with zero will actually uh, allow that positive value to be uh, considered in this loss function so that means this this second term will be active only for points which are currently inside our margin because that means our margin is not perfect and we still need to do some work to improve it we need to push we need to change the lines something like that but as soon as a point goes outside the margin then this second term will be equal to zero so um that's how people write this loss function and actually uh, this term is also if you uh, do the analysis that we talked about before it is also convex uh, it is also convex in in theta because theta is basically our w and d over here uh, so if you actually uh, do that alpha plus one minus alpha kind of thing on this function you will find that it is also convex so that means this whole loss function now we made it convex so we can use that kind of gradient descent uh, method to solve for the loss function now there are some other details here that i'm not going to go into because i want to also finally cover um, another part of our topic where um, Um, I want to relate all of this. I want to relate all of this to images and things like that, because so far we, we we've just been talking about some kind of abstract um, abstract 
uh, input x, uh, but this input x can be an image as well, right? So um, for a long time, people, lots of people were doing lots of research on this SVM. People are still doing research on SVMs, but this input x uh, to give as an input to the SVM, uh, a lot of research focused on what that input x should look like. So if you are given an image, um, then people will um, people will derive various different features from it. Like, what is the average brightness of all the pixels in the image, or what are other image statistics like variance of the various pixel values and things like that. And they will make one whole big x vector, which collects uh, which collects all the different uh, features that they can think about, because like um, this cartoon, this sort of hypothetical cartoon example that I drew here is very easy looking, right? But in the real world, uh, in the real world, it's not necessary that the data is clearly kind of separable by a line like that. It could be, you know, that there are, um, they're kind of like mixed sort of like this. So in this case, you know that, you know, if you draw this kind of decision boundary, then you can classify this data set, but it's this decision boundary is not a line, right? So the lots of things that people do is try to convert this two dimensional space into some other higher dimensional space where like let's say five dimensional or 10 dimensional space by applying various tricks to x1 and x2. Uh, in that higher 10 dimensional space, maybe it looks like they are transformed in such a way that a single line can divide them up into, into the two different classes. And then they can use SVM in that, SVM in that higher 10 dimensional space. So um, that is very, very much applicable in images, right? Because you can you can think about various kinds of features. Another very important features that people used was uh, convolution. So convolution with what is called a filter. A uh, filter is a very simple thing. It just means that if this is your image, then you take a smaller rectangular kind of thing let's say it is three by three. Um, so what you do is you uh, you put, you take this thing and you move it all across the image in this kind of zigzag manner, right? So when the filter is here, it will take this value and multiplying multiply it with the image pixel value that is under under that filter. So it is, it is kind of like if the pixels are P and the filters, uh, if the if the pixels are P and the filter numbers are W, then it will just be like P1, W1. So that's this. And then the next one, they will add it. So P2, W2 up to P9, W9. This will create uh, an output Y. So if you imagine this output Y will be the value of the first pixel in the output image. Then you will uh, slide this filter by one pixel. So it shifts by one pixel. So now you have kind of like this. Then you do the same operation again. That gives you this one number here. Then you... Um, again shift by one pixel, right? That will give you this third number here. So there is red, white, green, that kind of thing. So that is how basically you can, um, you have a filter, the filter can have any values in it and you can slide a filter all along the image and get another output image. 
so people created various different kinds of filters took these values uh, combined them in various ways like calculated histograms uh, calculated frequencies um, so many so many different things and they put all of that in one large feature vector which is called a feature vector um, so if people think that i want to detect uh, let's say people think i want to detect lines right so then they will design a filter which will give a high output when uh, the the image area underneath that filter looks like a line right so they will design that filter, take its output and put it in this feature vector and things like that. So, um, and then afterwards you will train an SVM on using all these feature vectors. The, the, reason, the reason why deep learning became more and more popular is the, in the starting point of the popularity of deep learning was its applications in computer vision. So now it's used in all kinds of natural language processing, uh, robotics, all kinds of fields. But the recent popularity of deep learning started with applying on machine data, uh, computer vision data, where um, people said, okay, all this, you know, designing filters by thinking about what is important for our problem is not very sustainable because then for each new problem you need to think about all our new feature vectors and one feature vector might not work with another so people thought that instead what we should decide is the class class of the model right so remember when i said in the start of the lecture uh, the class of the model shows the how many parameters you have you can have the class of a model is a line or as a parabola. In this case, they said the class of the model is just going to be these convolutional filters. So we will not look at any other kind of features like histogram of pixels or things like that. We will only uh, construct all our features from these filters, but uh, we will actually learn based for each different data set, we will allow these filters to be learned specially for that data set. So it will figure out what filters it needs automatically uh, to perform well on that data set. So let's say you're trying to detect dogs, then maybe you need uh, some filter that looks at a curved shape like that. Uh, or maybe if you're trying to detect uh, some kind of line or some kind of flag or something like that then you need a filter that detects a line um, and the idea is those kinds of things should be learned automatically based on the loss function that you have and that gave rise to uh, deep learning and we will look at the basic concept of the basic concept of that um, so for now, let us come back, uh, you know, like let us go back uh, from images to just vector data. So let's say you have some vector, uh, some vector input X. And let's say you decided the class of features is going to be, um, is just going to be some uh, matrix multiplications and additions. So that means the only operation, the only operation that you can do is um, matrix multiplication and vector addition. So then let's say you have some matrix W1. Uh, so this is going to be um n by one now this will be m by n you know so this will transform uh, this vector x from n dimensional to m dimensional and you have, you can do vector addition so this will again be m dimensional right uh, so now you got this vector x1 
then maybe you can do many many operations as long as they involve this matrix multiplication vectorization so the x2 will be equals uh, some other matrix w2 times x1 plus uh, b2 and so on and so forth so uh you do that and finally you get your output y so if this output y is one dimensional output then this matrix remember our x1 vector is uh, is m dimensional so then this needs to be one by m and this is just one by one right so now our x2 which is x2 will become one by one and we are just calling x2 as our output so we'll denote our output as y so we transformed our input to our output um, so we impose this class of functions vector multiplication matrix multiplication vector addition so then the problem becomes deciding the values of this matrix and the vectors so deciding the values of w and b and now that we have this output it will go into our loss function which will measure it also has access to the ground truth y star so it will measure how good this current prediction is using the current values of w1 b1 w2 b2 right it will measure that and it will generate some feedback which will go back in this direction and it will update the values of our w's and b's so that the next time we make a prediction it is slightly better um, so if you realize what we're doing we're doing that gradient descent right we are taking we are doing the gradient or differentiation of this loss function with respect to this w and b and things like that and updating them and so i will go into details of that but first let us just actually write out write down this thing so we have uh, y equals w2 x1 plus b2 and we are going to write out the actual equation of x1 which is w1 x plus b1 right so this becomes w2 w1 x plus w2 b1 plus b2 right so actually this we can write as another kind of w times x plus b right because you can combine these two matrices into one matrix and this is a vector this is a vector of the same dimension we can combine them into b so what this means is that if we have uh, multiple rounds of this matrix multiplication and vector addition then actually it is the same as doing one round because ultimately the effect of this is the same as uh, doing this with one matrix and one vector so there's no point in doing multiple rounds unless you put you put something in the middle which we will call uh, so we'll call this here x2 dash um sorry We'll call this one x1 dash and x1 dash is some sigma of x1 and this sigma is called a non-linearity or non-linearity means that it is not this matrix and vector multiplication it can be some other thing like like a, a sigmoid function or something like that i mean you can search on the internet there are many many different non-linearities that people use in deep learning it can be one very simple one is called uh, a rectified linear unit so it is basically called value rectified linear unit and the idea is very close to kind of voltage rectification where you are value of x is equal to max of 
0 and x. So if x is less than 0, then you output just 0. If x is greater than 0, then you output x. So you can see that this is not, uh, if you plot it, it's not going to be a line, right? It's it's going to be some kind of nonlinear function. And this nonlinearity is needed because that then that allows us that prevents this kind of collapse of multiple linear functions into a single linear function. So this kind of chain of operations, um, let us look at that in terms of uh, what is called a graph. Um, and by a graph, I, I don't mean some kind of like a plot graph, but uh, another like computer computer vision computer science graph where you have various nodes like you know like nodes which are connected by connections like this so like for example facebook social network is a graph like this where each node is a person and if someone is a friend then you have a connection between them that is also called a graph we can represent this whole operation also as a graph where what will the node be so the node will be uh, let's say this matrix multiplication uh, so input is our x then another node will be addition of vector so you see that the nodes are representing some kind of operation that we are doing on the data and the data is kind of coming through this these lines that are connecting so this node is performing the operation of multiplying its input data with the parameter that it has so here it is w1 here it is b1 right then there will be uh, let's say there will be another node which is doing this non-linearity but this non-linearity for example if it's ReLU it doesn't have any parameter like it just takes its input it knows the function and it just generates the output right so some nodes have parameters some don't then again we are doing another matrix multiplication with w2 another addition with b2 so this becomes our x1 this is our x1 dash this becomes our x2 or which is equal to y and this another node is our loss function right which also does not have any parameter like it will has it, it has another input which is our ground truth but there's no parameter inside the loss function that it is that is unknown it is just a fixed function but these nodes they have some variables that needs to be changed now what happens you calculate your loss function you know let's say uh, so what is your theta here it is the collection of all w1 b1 w2 b2 and all those things right um, so you calculate for, for the current value of all these w's and b's you calculate your loss function then the idea is each node knows how to differentiate its operation let's say let's let's just take this node for example here so this node what it does is uh, let's say its input is x and output is y so it will just do y equals x plus b2 so this is uh, now if we know if we know the gradient of l with respect to y right so and we are differentiating this equation uh, yeah so if we know this 
then basically it is saying that um, this is actually going to be this something like this right um because you can you can think about this intuitively like if you if you increase b2 then y will also increase and it is like a direct direct increasement and if y increases then that changes this del l by del y kind of thing so um similarly you can have another node where y equals w times x so it takes it input and multiplies it by this matrix w um, so similarly now if you know you know the gradient of this loss function with respect to this then the gradient of the loss function with respect to w is actually equals to the chain rule it's going to be uh, del l by del y del y by del x so del l by del y and we know the relation between y and x so y is w times x so it is going to be w right um, so that means uh, if we know the gradient of the loss function with respect to the output of our node, then we know the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameter of our node. And then we can use that gradient to update to update the parameters of the different nodes. And the only thing that needs to happen is that each node in our graph needs to know how to do this kind of need to know how to do this kind of chain rule for the operation that it performs and by chaining together many many different nodes and operations like this you can make a, a very big complicated function so sort of for this equation if you want to know del l by del b2 then basically del l by del y del y by del b2 and del y by del b2 is equal to this is equal to 1 because of this equation so del l by del b2 equals to del l by del y and so uh, once we know those gradients we saw how to do the gradient descent so let's say the current value of some parameter is w0 then we have you know this is called the step size some some number mu uh, times del l by del w at w equals w0 so we will at w0 we will calculate this gradient using this chain rule update the w0 we will get the new value w1 we will repeat that procedure for um, all the different nodes in our graph so then our network will have been updated uh, and then we will get a new uh, we will we'll kind of repeat that for many many different iteration actually like thousands and millions of iterations and finally uh, we will get a reasonably good value of this theta um, which minimizes this loss function now remember because we had this non-linearity uh, we don't have this con nice convexity property uh, so this is uh, for for a typical neural network it actually is kind of like very non-convex function but um still if we just what we have found through all our experiments uh, is if we do this training with larger and larger amounts of data um, and with uh, many many random restarts then ultimately we end up um, 
finding the value of the parameter that minimizes the loss function pretty well. And that is what we mean by training the neural network. So I think that is it for today. I, I'm sorry I went a little bit over time, but I think all of this was uh, quite necessary to explain this whole chain rule and things like that. Um, next time I will very quickly, I will very quickly go through how to apply these neural networks to actual images in computer vision. And then we will uh, and sort of end the whole lecture series by talking about some robotics topics. And uh, there is a homework related to this also, but I will uh, release that in uh, one or two days and send you an email uh, about that. It's, it's It will go into be sort of like this Google collab, just like how the previous homeworks were. So yes, I think that is it for today. If you have any questions, I can answer those questions. Any question? Any doubt? So the most Thank important thing Thank you so much to, for uh, spending your time. Yeah. Yes, sir. The most important thing to remember is this kind of graph representation. And all these TensorFlow, PyTorch, and things like that, that you might have heard about, uh, ultimately they are libraries which implement this graph and they give you all these nodes so that you can combine all the nodes and train your neural networks. Yeah. Okay, Samar, thank you so much.